this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Few wives of prominent men are more than a footnote in many histories, but they were often central to their husbands' lives. The classic well-known example is the relationship between the wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill and his wife Clementine. For months I've been sitting on Stephanie Van Steelen's biography of Mrs Patton called Lady of the Army, the Life of Mrs George S. Patton. Following my look at George Patton in the last episode, I thought it was an opportune time to look at his wife, Beatrice. So, Stephanie, welcome and thanks for joining me. Now, let's start with Beatrice Banning Eyre, who would become Mrs. Patton. What is her family background? Well, her family background has absolutely nothing to do with the army. She grew up in a very wealthy family. Her father was Frederick Eyre, who was an industrialist, who, frankly, no one's ever heard of. He wasn't a, he wasn't a Vanderbilt or an Astor, but in, in New England, where they lived, I would say that they were as important and as uh, well-established. And he made his fortune. He came from nothing. He was picking sticks and stones starting at the age of three. And he moved his way up. He was always very eager to buy his first pair of skates. That was his idea when he was trying to make money. So he he did that starting at age three all the way until he died at 96. He never stopped working a day in his life. And, and that was a trait that all the heirs possessed. But anyway, he uh, he grew up in New York, Connecticut. He made some money uh, over by the Erie Canal in a shop until 1850. He got a call, or not a call, he got a telegram probably at that point from his brother who had started a patent medicine business in Lowell, Massachusetts. And he joined his brother and they became partners and they became very successful. They had these products for hair growth, which uh, George Patton used years later. Uh, they had a, a medicine called sarsaparilla, which had some cocaine or heroin in it. So uh, uh, mothers used to give little drops to their babies if they were going traveling. It was a very successful business, successful enough that they expanded into textile. So Frederick Eyre, Beatrice's father, she he bought, in the end, probably 60 or 70 textile mills along the Merrimack River, which is the biggest river in that area. And he made his fortune growing the biggest uh, woolen company, pretty much a textile company in the world in the 1890s and 1900s, the American Woolen Company. He had been looking for a wife. He was too busy working. He eventually found one when he was about 40. He had four children, two daughters and two sons. Unfortunately, his wife passed away when she was 40, 45, something like that. And He didn't expect to marry again, but there was a young lady about 30 years of age who his sister-in-law thought would be a good match for him, even though he was about 60 at that time. And she was, it's, it's kind of a funny story. Everyone tells it differently, but basically she was asked to have dinner with him at a, at a party and she refused because a famous actor was going to put on a play, a Shakespeare play. And she had been an actress herself. And she said, I, I don't care about the, the rich man who's coming to dinner. I, I'm going to go watch this, watch this actor. Uh, and Frederick Eyre was so int- intrigued by this that he went to the theater and picked her up afterwards. And they married and they had three more children. So that would be Beatrice, the eldest. Uh, she was born in 1866, uh, 1886, I'm sorry. Then she had a brother, Frederick Eyre Jr. and another sister, Catherine Kay. And all of them, all the heirs, there there's seven of them, they, they kind of bonded and became one big family. They were very important to Beatrice and to George. I call them George and Beatrice. It, I've spent so much time with them. <laughs> it's, it's no sign of disrespect. It's just uh, easier. They were very important to uh, George and Beatrice later in life. During World War II, World War I, they supported them throughout everything. So that's basically Beatrice was born in, in a family of wealth. And she grew up in a family that was very modern and forward thinking. 
uh, which definitely helped her becoming an, an army wife and being the wife of, of George Patton. She was independent. She traveled a lot. She learned to speak French. She lived in, in Europe for two years. So all those experiences helped her. Did Beatrice and George know each other? Had they bumped into one another in childhood? Um, no, they actually lived on opposite ends of America. So Beatrice grew up in uh, Massachusetts. And then George grew up in California, in San Marino, which is still around. Uh, his family, his grandfather on his mother's side, which is probably a part that not that many people talk about. Uh, he was actually the first mayor uh, or the second mayor of Los Angeles. He owned a lot of land there. So he just never really spent much time thinking about that part of the family. He enjoyed the patent side of the family because they were warriors and, you know, they had fought in the Civil War and in the Revolutionary War. So that's what he, he liked to talk about. But he grew up on, they grew up on opposite sides of America. And surprisingly, Beatrice's mother came from a big family and they had settled all across the country, including in California. Her sister lived there and had married a son of a former partner of Patton's grandfather. So the Patton's knew the heirs by name. Actually, first, when Beatrice was six, they visited for the first time, uh, which must have been 1892. So George was about the same age, and they were supposed to go visit the Patton's, uh, but Beatrice was already very stubborn, and she refused to, to join her parents. So she stayed... Uh, with her uh, on her uncle's farm, so they they missed the chance to meet at that point. Beatrice had already said, "I never want to meet that boy." So you know, until she actually did in 1902, and she stepped off the train. They were visiting family in California in Los Angeles, and she stepped off the train and she saw George Patton, who was there because they were the same age. He was supposed to chaperone her and show her around, which was a horrible thing for him because when she stepped off the train she looked like a child even though she was 16 she had long hair she had a she carried a doll that was dressed the same way that she was and here he was this tough guy that everyone knew you know to kill goats on, on Catalina Island things like that and so he was very embarrassed that he had to show her around then that that's what happened they went to the island Catalina Island across Los Angeles in the bay he tried to get rid of her you know he did the most daring things that he could think of go swimming go boating and fishing amongst the rocks and she followed him everywhere and she did that for the rest of her life that's you know from the moment she met him <laughs> so did she essentially pursue it was it her pursuing him at this point how long was it before they well is it When's he go to West Point? Uh, he goes to West Point in 1905. So we're not, they meet in 1902, and there's about three years. I mean, he goes to VMI first in 1904. So there's about two years where they're separated by long distance. And at that point, it's, it's Beatrice who pursues him. Because surprisingly, when you see Pat, I mean, George, or what, uh, he is very, he looks very self-assured and very sure of himself and things like that. But he was actually very insecure, and she was the secure one. So after the, the vacation in 1902, he kind of realized, he was like, hmm, you know, there's something about this girl, although he wasn't interested in, in getting married at that point because he just wanted to go fight and, and die a glorious death. <laughs> so, and a, a woman would only complicate that. So... It was Beatrice who started pursuing him first by talking to his mom. I mean, e uh, I was going to say emailing, I <laughs> mailing a letter to his mother, to his aunt. <laughs> yeah, so it took him about five years to figure out that what was happening was actually that she was in love with him. He, he realized he was in love with her. He just never made the connection that what she was doing was actually, you know, the same thing, that she was in love with him. Courtship in slow motion, isn't it? With all these letters from different parts of the country, uh, I guess, as he goes through um, West Point. When it gets to the point of him asking her, her to marry him, <laughs> um, would, um, oh, I presume, he, did he, I presume he asked her family first, was a mar marriage acceptable to her family? Was George an acceptable character? 
Because it strikes me as being slightly different from her family and upbringing. Definitely. It, it was definitely not what they expected. Being in Boston and having, you know, the, the kind of life that she led, she had already had suitors, you know, apparently a, a Russian prince at some point and, you know, sons of an industrial family, things like that. But she wasn't interested in that at all. She liked the idea of adventure. But since her parents knew, knew the patents and knew George, kind of from a younger age, they liked him. The way I like to look at it is that uh, her father, Frederick, he liked George Patton, the man. He didn't like George Patton, the officer. So whenever he had a chance, he would travel up to, to Boston, which was very nice. He was used to a, uh, a certain lifestyle himself. His, his family wasn't poor. They were, they were well off. He had a, a nice childhood. He never wanted for anything. And he kind of took that with him, a little bit of snobbery, actually, if we can say it like that. So it was very fun for him to spend time, for example, Boston, where they lived in the only Tiffany-built mansion in the world. So compare that to West Point, where he was sleeping on a, on a straw mattress and, and things like that. He was always welcome to visit, and no one really cared that he was studying uh, to be an officer. Everyone expected him to just graduate and then probably maybe leave the army. And that's what her father did. He said, just to come work for me. Uh, you can work in, in my company. You'll, you'll enjoy it. It's wonderful. And he thought about it for a very long time, not just for himself, but he, for Beatrice, because he didn't want to take her away from that, that lifestyle. There's some very interesting letters going back and forward between uh, Frederick and George. And eventually... George said, you know what, being an officer is as important to me as, as breeding. It's not going to be a life that I want to lead if I'm not in the army. So you have to accept that's what I'm going to be. And at that point, Frederick said, okay, you know what, I'll make the money and you make the glory. Th that's what they did. And so George was accepted and the marriage was okay. And they got married in 1910. Yeah, she's lived a life of opulence. So, you know, fair enough, he's been at West Point and it's probably been more austere. But when she becomes an army wife, life becomes complicated by presumably customs and a whole lifestyle she's not aware of. And I assume uh, there is nowhere near as opulence as, as she is uh, used to when you're on, on, on camp. How well does she fit into this army life, Beatrice? At first, well, especially because when they married, he had only been a, uh, in the, an officer for about a year. So it wasn't that he was high ranking and had, had good quarters. But she had one thing going for her, and that was she had a, a big sense of adventure. And even her father had said, you know, it, she'll get used to it. She likes roughing it to a certain extent. And, and she had shown that, you know, traveling through Egypt, uh, she would jump into into pits and you know it's uh, almost with someone saved her from jumping into a pit with a cobra so she was adventurous and money and and opulence didn't matter that much to her she she liked the sense of adventure and going places that she'd never been but i guess i think she underestimated it a little the first few years of her marriage as an army wife were not the easiest she she adjusted well but there were certain customs that she hadn't picked up on yet. Like, you know, being in the army is like being in one big family. Uh, she was used to living her own life. People had certain rules. You know, you didn't. The, the, the most telling story is the one where, so in Boston, where she grew up, if you wanted to visit your neighbors or someone else, you, you dropped off a calling card. And you just didn't show up unexpected. When she had been married for about a year, uh, and she was, at home pregnant at that point the army wife the eldest army wife showed up at her door at unannounced knocking and she casually asked if Beatrice uh, knew that she was pregnant because she hadn't talked to anyone and she hadn't seen the, the army post doctor uh, so she, at that point she didn't integrate that much yet so, you know she she went to Chicago to go see the doctor. She still spoke to her own family. Her her family visited constantly. You know, her sister lived with them for a few months. Her parents were there whenever they could. So it took a while to adjust. And it took three or four years into her marriage when they were in the middle of nowhere at an army post that had nothing, no museums, no theaters or anything. 
uh, she had been visiting her parents once again and people were gossiping about her and, and she was like, oh, I mean, <laughs> why are they talking about me? And she was walking around with her daughter at that point and she realized that where they were stationed, they could see, it used to be, even though they were in the desert pretty much, it used to be a, a lake millions of years ago. And that's when she realized, you know, even in the most difficult situations, there's a positive thing to find and there's something to learn. And, you know, that reinvigorated her sense of adventure. And from that point on, she, she made a 360 and she was off. That's that's when she became a true army wife, I think. Yeah, I got the feeling that also helped as she slightly went up the, uh, well, as George went up the uh, army career ladder and uh, the, the wealth helped them out more and helped smooth out that integration into army life. But fundamentally, she made the change to be able to fit in, to be part of the army family was the feeling that I sort of got from uh, reading about her. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, she made the most, she knew that he was never going to change. And that was something when she married him that she was okay with. Uh, so I think her whole life was was continually trying to adjust and adapt to to changing circumstances, to her surroundings and to him because he, his personality changes throughout the years that they're married uh, much more than that hers does. So, well, the big, presumably the big, well, one of the major large challenges that they face is the, well, I was going to say the First World War, but it's actually the, the it's Pershing's Mexican expedition, which then almost leads on to the First World War. How does she cope with him? Well, certainly, you know, the first time when if you think she's an army wife, she becomes a wartime wife. How does she cope with him being away, say, on the Mexican ex- expedition? Um, it was a lot harder than she expected, I think. They hadn't been separated only for small periods of time when she was traveling her, her fa- to her family and he was going on, on you know, uh, on business or something like that. But they had been living on the border for quite a while before the expedition started. So she knew how dangerous it was, you know, a few miles from where they lived, you know, the, the Pancho Villa raids took place. So she knew it, it was a dangerous thing. And, and she knew her husband that he was not going to shy away from danger. And at, I think at that point, she hadn't accepted that yet. That would come later. She would be okay with that. But at this point, she's young. She has two children. Uh, she still has in her mind that she really wants to have a son. That was something that she really wanted. And she really wanted to give uh, George a son to continue, you know, the the line because they had been warriors from generations before. So that's that was kind of an idea she had. And then coupled with that, at that period of time, her parents were getting older and she was very, very close to them. Her father was 94 at the time and her mother was around 60, 64, but she was not in good health. So it was an extremely difficult time and she didn't take it very well. Uh, She was constantly worried. She was starting to have issues, heart issues is what they say. I don't have medical records, but, you know, she, uh, she wasn't feeling too well and she did her best, but, you know, there was too much to worry about. And, but she stayed by the border because she figured if something does happen, then I, I'm here close by and, you know, I, whenever he comes back or if I'll be here. And this, this extended into World War II, which was just as difficult, except at that point, a lot of, you know, Paris, people were living a rather decent life in Paris at the time, which I, I didn't know before I started researching this. And it was surprising to read these letters that George wrote saying, oh, it's, you know, it's, I found an apartment. You should come over and, you know, you can be here and whatever. So she tried that for months and months at a time, making herself sick, trying to get there because she and she was going to leave her children with her parents and she was going to go to Europe. And then Pershing put a stop to that, not not just for them, but in general, uh, wives were no longer allowed to travel. So she was stuck in, well, with her parents for the duration of World War II and that's kind of when she learned to take it. She lost her parents within a span of one month in March 1918. Then a month later, and it was reported that George had been killed in the war. That wasn't true. That was a, a, another George Patton. So that added to the worry. And then he actually uh, gets shot during the Muse or gone offensive, but survives. So... They were very stressful times. She didn't deal too well with it, as she said herself. 
But by the time he came back, you know, there had been a, a switch in her and she was a, a totally different person. She was independent. She no longer had to uh, worry about her parents, about things like that. All she had to worry about now was her husband and her children, which kind of gave her a peace of mind. Did they write continually throughout the First World War when they were aware? Yes. He writes, you could almost follow it daily. Her letters are harder to find. I don't know if he threw them away or if she burned them at some point. But there's, if there's, let's, for every 10 letters of his, there's maybe one or two of hers. I've often wondered if he needed more that relates to write to her than necessarily she needed to write to him. Exactly. And she often wrote like one week. She would take a week to write a letter and add on to it every day, especially during World War II. He would be writing... And I, I guess it makes sense in a way. Whenever he had a few moments in the evening, he would write a shorter note. But basically, you could say that's at least on average three or four letters a week he would be writing, uh, telling her everything. It's it's interesting that he's sort of leaning on her, but he's not. It's not necessarily what you expect from the patent character uh, with with all his bombast. No, it, it was surprising, and and that's why I'm like, oh, there could you know she is more important than most people think because he needed to be able to tell her everything. And, and I think it, it's funny because, especially during World War II, and actually World War I too, but there's not many pictures. If you look at him, he often has a camera with him. You know, standing on the beach in Sicily, he has his camera. It's everywhere. And it's something that he did when he married her. Even he would take pictures and send them to her. So, uh, so she would know pretty much everything. <laughs> And she could, and she could see where he was, and and yeah, it's it, I guess a modern day email. It just took a lot longer, and yeah, it's slow motion. Yeah, <laughs> very connected, very connected people who keep who can afford to keep one another appraised. Exactly, with photographs and letters and time to uh, 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 and the space to do these letters. So he, he comes through the first world war. He gets. He has some story about him being shot in the ass, doesn't he? And he's a half-assed general. Anyway, um, uh, they, uh, they're at Camp Mead not long after the end of the First World War. Intriguingly, with the Eisenhowers, I presume that's the first time they sort of bump into the Eisenhowers. How does Mrs. Patton get on with Mrs. Eisenhower? What's the dynamic there? It was interesting. They were from very different backgrounds. Actually, Mrs. Eisenhower, she grew up in a... A rather well-off family as well, but except that when she married General or Eisenhower, she didn't have her her parents or her father did not necessarily want to support her into marrying an officer, so they were kind of living the life that that someone you know at their rank would be living at that time, which was extremely different from the patents. The guys hit it off right away because, you know, they both were crazy about tanks. They were, you know, driving around in, in George's Packard looking for bandits who had been <laughs> raiding uh, Camp Mead and things like that. Beatrice and Mamie, on the other hand, they were too different to get. I mean, they were friendly. They, they met up throughout the years for lunch and dinner whenever uh, they were around each other. But they were never close. Beatrice was cultured. She wanted to do things, go on adventures, uh, read, listen to music, go to the opera. Mrs. Eisenhower enjoyed being at home, sitting in the backyard. That, that's the story. You know, she was very glamorous compared to Beatrice, apparently, because Beatrice's two daughters were always spying uh, at her through the uh, <laughs> through the fence. Because she she would be she looked so glamorous compared to Beatrice, who you know she rode horses and things. So she uh, and she played piano. She, she had short nails. Her hair was up and things like that. So <laughs> it was a very different. And they got along, but they were never the best of friends. Isn't that intriguing? Because you kind of wondered if they, you know they they'd be uh, bonded together through uh, through the army life. I think at, at some point there might have been some jealousy. I don't know. Maybe you know. Eisenhower's had decorated with, you know, uh, their chairs were crates from <laughs> apple crates and, you know, things like that, stories that they tell uh, while uh, Beatrice had usually a, a chauffeur, a maid, someone to take care of, of things. Yeah, they respected each other at that point. <laughs> that's for sure. And, you know. Now, one thing I forgot to ask, 
there's a great story of Beatrice waiting for George when he returns from World War One, isn't there? And having an altercation with a uh, reserve colonel. So after after World War One, she's she's a, a different person. She kind of comes into her own and she stands up more for herself and, and for what she believes. And, and uh, but. Beatrice is adventurous, but she's also very um, volatile. You know, you think of, of General Patton as this bombastic, yelling, you know, very stern officer. But uh, Beatrice was just could be just as as volatile, and she had a big temper. Uh, her temper even scared George. <laughs> After World War One, she was she had always believed in George that he was gonna one day, you know, become a a, a general and a, 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 an important officer. That was the one thing that she truly believed in, and you could not offend her husband in front of her. So while they're all dressed up to go to a fancy party in Washington D.C., he drops her off at the entrance, and like you mentioned, there's a reserve colonel waiting with her in the uh, lobby, and. George is approaching and they can see him through the doorway and he's dressed up in his uniform, uh, wearing his medals and, you know, he's back from World War I. And, well, George was opinionated and he had always thought Beatrice, a uh, rather uh, heavyset officer, is usually one who just sits behind the desk and never goes fighting. So, and that was the gentleman that was standing next to her. And, and he mentioned, oh, look at that little young chicken walking over, you know, with all his medals and things like that. And that triggered her. And the story goes that she punched him. And by the time George walked in, she was sitting on top of him, <laughs> beating him up. It's fantastic. George, George is six foot. She must be a foot shorter than him. Small lady. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was five two or something. Yeah. And it's it's a story, and that reputation, like she said, in the army you have to be careful because the reputation sticks to you like your skin, and that stuck to her. You know, even thirty years later, General Marshall was still talking about you know how Beatrice <laughs> did that, and and that's the tendency she had. She sometimes made him worse. You know, George could be very could drive you crazy, but she she sometimes made him worse by. <laughs> Pushing him a lot because the other the other interesting thing I thought about that the, these interwar years is they're twice well George is twice posted to Hawaii and I think Beatrice and the family did join them in Hawaii joined did join George in Hawaii didn't they did they enjoy their time in Hawaii because there's a few interesting sort of stories from Hawaii she becomes an author and they're sailing they sailed there to and from. That- the first time they went was in 1925, which was not, they weren't excited about that. At that time, they were actually stationed near Boston. So Beatrice was with her family. Uh, they were living in a, a big house on the North Shore. So kind of the life that she had grown accustomed to when she was young. Uh, not that she really wanted that, but it, it was just nice to be with her brothers and sisters and their children. So the first time they sailed through the Panama Canal and they spent three years there they enjoyed it a lot. I learned a lot about Hawaii that I didn't know. One thing is that it's uh, very famous for their horses and they have a big horse farms out there. And and George Patton is a cavalry officer who was known as as one of the best in the cavalry at that point. So they get to travel the islands buying horses for the army. And that's when Beatrice starts meeting all these native, all the native Hawaiians. And, you know, they were the Polynesians who had arrived, the the Japanese and a big melting pot. And most people in the army avoided them. So the army was not very well regarded in Hawaii at that time. But she kind of, you know, bridged that gap and she befriended all of them. For some reason, she had this knack to... And I guess maybe that's that's how she got along with George Patton for all those years. But people just liked her and opened up to her. And she had a, a way of connecting. And I, I think it's because she had this saying, and I think that's the essence of her, interested people are interesting. And that's kind of the, the, how she lived her life. And at one point, I think that's the the most fun story i think is she befriends the guy who kind of is the inventor of the shaka sign you know he's a he's a, a hamana kalili he's this big guy on on hawaii who catches lobster with his bare hands and he works on the sugar plantations where he lost his middle fingers in an accident so that's how it, the whole story came about and he introduces her to other people and she is gathering all these stories 
that she takes back home to to the mainland in 1928. And she writes her first book in French because she wanted to see if she could still speak French. And it was just a family book, but uh, it's beautifully done. There's about 100 out in the world somewhere. So uh, (laughs) she keeps thinking about Hawaii because she really lost her heart there. She loved it so much. So we skip about eight years and a lot happens. And, you know, at this point, George is getting more and more depressed because there's no war and he really needs, he needs one to show what he's capable of. And she's getting more important and, you know, becoming more independent. So in 1935, that's indeed, they, they buy a schooner and they sail to Hawaii. They have no experience. I mean, she was a, a sailor on the North Shore, but <laughs> it's very different from uh, <laughs> sailing to Hawaii. But they get lucky. George is the navigator, isn't he? He's just done a couple of weeks course in navigation. It's a big ocean with a small island, you know. And for someone without any training, you wouldn't want to miss it by, you know, a few degrees out and you're out for a long way. I think I think a lot of people think of him as, you know, he's a general, he got lucky, you know, the Battle of the Bulge, all those things. But what many people don't realize is that he's very studious and he studied his whole life. Whenever he could, he would be reading books. And that's how he learned so much about military history. And that's why I think he believed he was reincarnated because all these things he learned as a child in his mind, I'm sure they kind of mixed together and it kind of had the sense that he was there, but he he wasn't. He had just read about it. But he he spends a few weeks studying to navigate and they do take along a few people that, you know, uh, two friends that have sailed the Atlantic Ocean to Europe at one point. And one of the most famous uh, uh, sailors, uh, a Swedish guy called Joe Eklund, who stays with them uh, until 1945. He remains like a lot of people. Uh, Whenever someone started working or being with the patents, they were loyal to them for a very long time. And they, they made it. The first, the crossing to Hawaii was easy and they made it within a few hours of what they expected and within a few miles of where they have hoped to be. Sailing back was not as easy <laughs> and they kind of got caught in the same storm or in, in the similar storm that Amelia Earhart got caught in because they heard on the radio that that she had she was missing so uh that's when they were like oh we're in trouble here it's amazing amazing to get back the other story i like from hawaii was it it is about george is an amateur engineer he gets what's what's engineering magazine mechanical engineering and he he makes his diving helmet and then makes beatrice wear it so her husband was was the center of her universe and at this point he's very depressed and she's gonna do everything she can to make him happy or to, to, you know, get him interested in something. And this includes this helmet he builds that weighs a ton. And she decides to, to try it out. And, you know, she puts it on. She sinks to the bottom of the ocean on their boat. And um, all's well. He's very happy. You know, he's like, look what a wonderful wife I have. How adventurous. And then they realized, you know, there was no more air coming in because their son was standing on the uh, the line. So... He had to get her out. <laughs> and she was fine with that. The crazier the things that she could do, the better. You know, she did it for him, but she also did it for herself because I think she was a little eccentric herself and um, he brought that out in her. She's a real sport. And unlike him, she I mean, he has a tremendous amount of accidents seemingly through throughout these interwar periods, falling off horses and crashing cars. She seems to go through it all, doing all kinds of sort of things without actually having all these accidents that he seems to be accident prone with. It amuses me. Her, her those interwar years seem to be uh, a litany of uh, of her sort of dealing with you know his concussion or his broken legs or a broken something or he's fallen off something else. And well, the reason he tried so many stupid things, I mean, a lot of them were stupid, I would say, or crazy, is that he believed that as long as every time he survived, that meant that God was saving him for something bigger. So that's why he he sailed on he sailed the ocean. He's like, if I make it, then I'm sure I'm I'm meant to be doing something bigger with my life and and in the end they couldn't notice of course but the, the sailing that he did helped him later during the war the world war ii you know the landings in sicily and north africa it, it gave him a, a little bit of insight and technical information that he wouldn't have had otherwise mm, well, it's fascinating she sort of lets him get on with it and then doesn't sort of say no george i've had enough of you 
breaking things, crashing cars. Well, she said it. Um, she wouldn't be able to handle him if she didn't give him that outlet. So, but, but for all that, she follows him round through his, uh, uh, into Walker. In 1940, he gets his dream job at Fort Benning. Uh, is that is that training the Second Armoured Brigade? But she declines to go with him initially. Why is that? It's a little blurry as in what actually happened. It's once again his letters are it's one sided and no one in the family or people I spoke to seemed to have an inkling. But so in Hawaii he was starting to become a, a, a big pain. And he was getting harder and harder to deal with, especially after an, another big fall. And and that's something that other authors have talked about he he fell off his horse in a polo game and it was uh i mean it happened many times before because but this time it, it probably led to a severe concussion that wasn't treated the way it should have been because you know he just got back on the horse and continued playing and then he went drinking and sailing so <laughs> it's a recipe for disaster his personality might have changed a little and he became very difficult to handle and for some reason he worked it out on Beatrice because she was an easy target she was there and he knew she was not gonna leave she was always gonna be there at that point her sister's daughter visited which is a a Jean Gordon that's a story many people know and focus on Uh, I don't necessarily do as much for reasons you know I don't think there was as much going on as, as they say or like to claim but the young girl was about 18, the same year, uh, the same age as, as his daughter, Ruth Ellen. And she, she had lost her father at a young age, and she had always looked up to Uncle George. And they might have begun a little dalliance during their visits. And so Beatrice uh, was upset about that, obviously. But, you know, she's, he has no one else. I'm going to stick it out, and I'm going to stay with him. And this continues. You know, they return to the mainland, and they end up in Fort Myer in 1940. He is is very difficult to handle. He had already blamed her that her money had caused, you know, him to lose out on on his dream job. That was was 1939. And that, that just did it for her because he had always, I mean, he's a hard worker, but he likes to play hard too. And he had his own money, but it was her money that allowed him to buy the fastest cars, the, you know, 20 horses, you know, everything that he wanted, he could buy. And then for him to say that her money uh, caused him to lose out on his dream job, that just did it for him. So, but she stayed once again. And then something must have happened that it probably a combination of all of those when he finally did get his dream job of training the Second Armored Brigade. He left. She didn't follow. He was uh, on the verge of sending her items, her books and furniture home. That's how, how far it had gotten. But he kept writing her. And she, she didn't write back for uh, about two weeks. And, and that's when it becomes obvious that he needed her because he was very good at training men and motivating them. But at that point, without her there, he was making a pretty big mess out of it. And it wasn't until she showed up and started, you know, taking care of everything. And she even wrote a march for the, for the, uh, for an orchestra that, you know, things picked up and he was in his element. And he just uh, did a, a great job of training the Second Armor Brigade and the division. Without her in the galleries, he said he was nobody. So they've twice been posted to Hawaii. So I wonder what the family's reaction is in the attack on Pearl Harbor, because presumably from one point of view, George is cane because there's a war and from her point of view she's going to be separated like she was potentially during the first world war which was problematic so i wonder what the fact what her reaction was to pearl harbor because it's all kinds of levels going on there especially as, they, as i said they knew the island she was not surprised when it happened because george had already written a paper back in 1935 or 1936 about a possible attack and, he, you know, he'd been slapped on the wrists for rocking the boat, so to say. So uh, that was that paper was shelved. But when she heard about it, it, it wasn't a, a big surprise after the initial shock, because she knew people there, obviously. that That's when she realized, like, oh, this is the moment my, George has been waiting for his whole life. And it's over. It was kind of a, a weird feeling. But she was, in a way, happy that it happened, because now, finally, after... You know, him waiting 20 years, pretty much. Yeah, 
she was he was finally going to be able to do what he had always wanted to do and then now her waiting was going to start and she was okay with that it i think at this point he was it was so necessary for him to do that that if it had not happened it would have been impossible almost to stay with him but like like i say i the war brought them back together they had a common goal one they had worked for for so long and um She wasn't going to leave him now. This was what they had worked for, not just him. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. I'm joined by Stephanie Van Steeland, and we're talking about Beatrice Patton. When he ships off to war, he'll be off to the Mediterranean. What what does she do? She remain on camp because she she'd be too old to volunteer for any of the services. Well, she she didn't have that. Uh, desire to follow him this time like the first world war so because she had realized that she could be just as important being in in america especially she now had three children who were all grown and married her two daughters were married to officers who both one fought in Astorin pass and was captured spent the, the, the rest of the war in prisoner of war camp and the other one fought in italy and then their son george Patton the fourth he was studying at west point she knew at this point George was fine on his own. You know, he he was doing what he wanted to do, and she stayed in the U.S. She um, she wanted to volunteer and do something, and or actually do something with the army officially. But indeed, she was too old. Uh, but then the War Department approached her and said, "You know, can you give speeches for us and go around selling war bonds?" And it, it wasn't what she initially wanted. Um, she had no experience. She was a very private person and she didn't like being in the spotlight, but, you know, it was what needed to be done. And she was uh, uh, quite good at it. And she did it all throughout the war. And even speaking to, because her French was so good, she was often broadcast in France, speaking to the population there. So that's what that's what kept her busy. Busy kept her from worrying. I'd forgotten that she spoke very good French. I thought it was really interesting that the American government utilised her to speak French to the French, which demonstrates, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not pidgin French. It really is fluent French from her part. And, and that helped George too, because in West Point and places they thought French, obviously, but he wasn't very good at it. Uh, and she always helped him with his with his French, and that you know when once he ends up in in North Africa, he ends up speaking quite a lot of French, and a lot of his letters at that point are like, "Oh, I'm so happy, you know you taught me this, and you you should have heard me speak how wonderful I sounded all because you taught me so uh, there's always you know her contributions it's not always a big thing, it's always little things throughout his life that come back to what she did at some point. Does she, does she become a household name across the uh, US? Does she like? Do you mind being in the spotlight? No, she actually hated it, especially because the press often showed up when there was a scandal, obviously. Well, I was, my next, I was going to ask about the slapping incident and how does that go down with her because she should be in the middle of it all. So she was a reluctant public figure, as she said herself. She did it because it helped the war. She was well known in army circles. Uh, everyone knew Mrs. Patton. And if you say, you know, in Fort Benning, for example, even 10, 20 years later, if you said, oh, I knew Mrs. Patton, you know, that opened the door. And she was fine with that. That's what she wanted. But being in the spotlight all over the country was not necessarily her thing, especially like, like you say, the slapping incident. They, they started knocking on her door when there was a scandal. For her... George Patton, like I said, was everything for her. And she would berate him and she would point out his mistakes in, in private. And uh, she, I think she was pretty much uh, the boss of the household. <laughs> but in public, she would never, ever do anything to uh, criticize him or say anything negative. So the slapping incident, she gave one polite statement and then she stopped talking to the press. She stopped her subscription to a clipping service because she uh, she scrapbooked a lot. And she was making these huge books for when he came home so he could read about himself. You know, that's... <laughs> uh, and at that point, she stopped him because it was all negative. Her address, I guess, was public. So the letters she received, you know, I hope your husband gets shot by the Germans. He's a this and that. So it was a 
very tough time and he apologized a lot in his letters to her at that point. But, you know, it happens again, you know, at, at the speech he gives where he forgets to mention the Russians. That happens again. So he's like, you know, I, I don't mind for myself. I mind it more for you, you know, what's happening. So every time something like that happens, she draws back and she just stays private for a little bit. And, and that's how she dealt with it. Uh, just not talk about it to anyone except in the family. After he goes to war, she only sees him once again, doesn't she? They separate for nearly two years, is that? Yeah, so he leaves October 1942, and he comes back June 1945. So th- they don't see each other during that time. They um, There's a few times where he is possibly coming home for a, a little break, and a lot of other officers, from what I could tell, did that. But he was so into getting there, getting reaching his destiny, as he liked to say. And she was fine with that. And, you know, she was fine with it to the point that when they left or when they when they said goodbye in 42, she pretty much told herself, I'm never going to see him again. So to actually have him back in June 45 for a, a war bond selling tour and this big parade through Boston was a miracle for her. When you say this big parade, these are enormous, but I didn't realize that the, the scale of these parades, there's a million people turning out to line the streets for some of these parades, isn't there for him? Yeah, it's uh, in Boston, there's a million. Same thing in Los Angeles, where he had a parade together with uh, Jimmy Doolittle. So they were both from Los Angeles. So that was like a homecoming. It happened to Eisenhower, Bradley. They all had these big parades. They were heroes. They're our household names. It's incredible how much you know a million people turning out is a real household name, and presumably she's in the car with them. Well, the car behind. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the that's the fun that's the funny thing. I mean, they had been separated so long, and they they had no privacy. He stepped off the plane, and the press was there, and and everyone, and they had thirty seconds, and then the parade started. So uh, she knew that was how it was, and she was okay with that. And they spent two weeks traveling the country and then two weeks together uh, at their home in, in South Hamilton, Massachusetts, you know, just trying to get a sense of normalcy back. But it's it's hard, you know, when uh, an officer returns or a soldier returns from war there, even though George claimed to be the same, he was not. Things had changed and to the point where he was sent back to Europe, obviously, and, and he he told his daughters, you know, I'm, I'm, you're never going to see me again. This is my goodbye. That's kind of how he felt at that point. I mean, incredible, considering that up to a point that you know, the war in Europe's over. But you know, he has that car accident, which will prove fatal in uh, December, December 45. How does she receive the news? Is, is, is the army knocking on her door? What's the reaction? No one really remembered, I guess. But the, the one story that to me seemed the most plausible and that I, I stuck with is that it wasn't the army who called first. It was, once again, a reporter from the Associated Press. And at, at this point, she hates the press because the press is not usually not very kind to uh, her husband. And she holds that against them. A, a lot of times they portrayed him as uh, this general who would send soldiers needlessly to die. And that's one of the things I try with the book is to say that he, he did care more for his soldiers than most people would think. He cared a lot for them and it, it hurt him, but it was just part of the job. And his whole life, he he had this mask on, uh, you know, General Patton. And, and Beatrice was the only one who knew the, the George Patton. That, that's what I like to say. So she, she hates the press and they call her to see how uh, her husband is doing, and she has no idea what happens. So, uh, and that that sets the whole thing in motion. You know, she reaches out to the war department and uh, to uh, General Eisenhower, who helps her uh, get to Europe as fast as possible. You know, with a passport and a a plane, which happens to be a a, pay, a plane that carries mail. So it's a it's a, a hellish two days to get to his bedside. But you know, it, she would have swum there if she had to. So for her, that was okay. Like the first of all, wives aren't meant to be there, but she manages to get there and Eisenhower is the one that gets her there. At that point, he had been trying to get her there too because the war was over and he wasn't doing very much at that point. So, you know, the 15th Army was writing the history of the war and, and it, he, it didn't work because it wasn't allowed yet. So he was 
he was thinking of resigning from the army in December 45, pretty much. The, he was leaving on vacation the, uh, the day after the accident happened. He was supposed to leave. And if he had gone home, he would have probably uh, resigned. And, you know, a lot of people these days say, oh, he would have made such a good president and that's what he was going to do. I, I do not believe that was his intention. He knew himself well enough and Beatrice knew him well enough that they would never have and uh, decided to, you know, join the presidential race at some point. That was not his thing. But yeah, be, be, with General Eisenhower's help, and then the whole army pretty much uh, helped her get to Heidelberg so she could spend the last 12 days of her husband's life, you know, with by his bedside, which was uh, very helpful. I hadn't realized, you know, when, when he dies, that how much of a potential problem it is. What do you do with... Patton, General Patton, so he's a national hero. Do you ship him home? Do you leave him in the country? How does that affect upon other families? So, what's the what 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 did they decide to do? And what you know, why is there any background? Why is this problematic? Because they're not re- bringing people home, are they? At this point, uh, in December '45, pretty much they they buried soldiers well where they fell, as they say, and they had started to set up big cemeteries, you know, dotted across Europe. No one was supposed to be brought home at that point. And Beatrice's first reaction when he died was indeed that she wanted him home and she wanted him buried in the U.S. And that was indeed problematic for General Eisenhower and a few other people, because how were they going to explain that it was allowed for her, but it wasn't allowed for, you know, the soldier who had died in the Battle of the Bulge. So um, they asked... There was a a doctor who joined her, uh, who became quite friendly with her, Colonel Sperling. He uh, took care of of George during uh, those two weeks that they were there. And he became very friendly with with, uh, Beatrice. And there's a a few pages that he wrote about that experience. And that the way he described her was one of the reasons that attracted me to her, because um, he said that her personality shone like a brilliant gem. And I'm like, that must be an interesting character. But anyway, that's digressing. He was given the task of trying to convince Beatrice that it would be best to bury uh, George with his soldiers. And I think some people say that he himself might have mentioned it. He might have. I'm sure that's something they discuss at some point. But she said, yeah, that makes sense. He should be here. And they gave her an option of three uh, cemeteries. And one of them was the what would become the American Luxembourg Cemetery, just a few miles from, you know, where his headquarters were during the Battle of the Bulge. And that's what she chose. And he was buried there. A few months later, actually, they did give families the options of shipping their loved ones home. And at that point, she decided not to do that. And she actually urged other family members, uh, she spoke quite openly about that, not to do it and just leave you know, it wasn't going to bring them back. It wasn't going to make a difference. And they were where they, you know, where she thought they belonged. So I think from the American Luxembourg Cemetery, they shipped quite a few back, enough that they had to re reorganize the whole thing. And that, that's where the whole issue starts, that they had to move him because he was so popular and he was buried in between everyone else. So he was equal. That's how she had wanted it. But they were trampling all the grass and everything. So... uh he was moved once to the head of the uh, of the group that were buried there, and they were going to move him again. But at that point, she said, "Enough is enough. You know, if you move him again, I'm taking him." <laughs> so, uh, and that they left him there, and now it's um, still being cared for by the Luxembourg people. So, uh, not just his grave, all the graves there. You know, they get flowers and they're well taken care of. When it came to the funeral, it's interesting because he's obviously a public figure. Did she, did her idea of a funeral align with what the military and the government wanted for a, such a prolific figure as a funeral? Yes, I think so. She had she actually gave the army they let she let them do her thing their thing actually she um, she would the the person uh, General Keys who was a very close friend of of Patton and was one of the few people allowed to be with him in his last days. So that's how close they were. He was in charge of organizing the funeral and she kept it simple. You know, there were only two hymns. I think the, the service in Heidelberg was only 20 minutes long. And then there's, the, you know, the big pro- procession and the, the train ride to Luxembourg. 
which that was very meaningful for her stopping in all the big cities and there, there were people waiting and bands were playing. You know, it was a very moving experience and she really showed herself to be a very strong character. Even in the middle of the night, she would go out and, and greet people and acknowledge what they were doing for her husband. So for her, it was it was the way I think that she wanted it. The other thing, especially after talking to Kevin, what I found fascinating is her relationship with Patton's reputation. And she very much curates his reputation after the war. Would that be one way of describing what she does? Because he has been writing his biography during the war, hasn't he? Or his, is his biography or his rem- rem- reminiscences of the war as the war is happening? So, yeah, that's her most cherished cherished memory or cherished, cherished thing was actually her husband's legacy and his reputation. That's why she was so upset when that officer, that reserve colonel, uh, said those things. Her, his reputation was the thing she was going to guard against everything. And she knew he died so shortly after the war ended that he never had a chance to tell his side of the story. And she knew once everyone else would start doing that, obviously everyone has their own opinion. And his story would have had his own you know, opinion as well. So it wouldn't have been different. But he never had a chance to, to tell his story. And he, she had all his letters and his diaries, obviously. And the first thing she did was he had been working on his a, a book about the war, which he called War As I Knew It. And he had pretty much finished it by the time his accident happened. So they, they actually spend a little bit of time talking about that while he's in the hospital. And she decides to finish it and to publish it, which does she publishes in 1947. So two years after the war. And obviously, everyone knew that he was very opinionated. <laughs> so everyone was... She gets it out very quick before everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's not as detailed as as he had if he had finished it and things like that. But she's she's urged to cut a lot of information from it by the War Department, and she had these two sides. You know, one side said you have to publish it; it's very important. The other one said don't publish it; just you know, take a small part and and publish it as a pamphlet for the War Department to teach colleges and things like that. But I guess she finds the middle ground and it's it's a it's not as exciting as if it had been written or finished by Patton himself, obviously. But she gets it out and it gives her a, a sense of closure at least. And then she does decide to give all his papers eventually. I mean her family afterwards decides to give everything he's written to the Library of Congress. So it's it, it'll be there for biographers and researchers, you know, whenever they need it. Considering the longevity of her father, I was quite surprised how young she died. I, I was kind of expecting her to be, you know, tottering along in her, in her hundreds, but she dies at 67. She was the youngest of the seven children to die. Uh, she wasn't the first, but she, uh, they all became 80, 90. She just had, I think, heart issues ran in the family. So her mother died of heart disease. Her own daughter, her eldest daughter, Beatrice, died a year before she died of uh, heart disease. And then uh, she died in 1953 yeah, of the same thing. And it, it, had, it had been an issue that had been bothering her since probably World War I. That's when the whole thing started. And I think at that point, like she says, she writes often in, in her diary herself, I mean, she was happy. She had, she led a full, how many years? She led, She lived eight more years after her husband, and she had a full life after that. She It wasn't like she was sitting at home crying. You know, she traveled the world trying to, to spread his, his memory. She had fun with her grandchildren. You know, the boat they built in, that they were going to sail together, she sailed it with her brother, and she kept hunting like she had always done with, with uh, George. But, you know, at some point she learns that her heart disease is, is getting worse and, you know, she'll have an aneurysm at, at some point. And she's like, I'm only going to stop driving because I might endanger other people. Other than that, I'll just keep going. And if, if it happens, it happens. It's fine. I've had a, a good life and I want to be with George. And and it's kind of ironic. And that's, that always struck me is that he always wanted to die in battle or on the, the back of a, a good horse during a hunt. It never happened for him. He probably had the worst 
a way to die imaginable for a man like him. But she actually died with her boots on and she died on the back of a horse hunting. So it's it's a kind of an ironic way, but it's very fitting, I think. But presumably she can't be with him at, at the end because she, she won't be able to be buried in a military cemetery in uh, Europe, presumably. Well, that, indeed. So before she died, she tried to get permission, official permission, <laughs> for a long time. And uh, it, it didn't work. And she just wanted to be with him. So when she eventually, when she dies, uh, she's cremated. And there's a, a, a stone in the backyard of their home where she presumably uh, would be. I But a, a few years after she dies, uh, her son and daughter and a few grandchildren traveled to Luxembourg. And they visit the, uh, the cemetery. Some say in the middle of the night. You know, uh, they left the gate open because uh, they they spread her ashes or some of her ashes over George's grave. So, you know, the little rebel <laughs> was was still there, and she, uh, yeah, I, I I believe they're together. Well, Stephanie, that would seem like a good place to finish. Thank you, loyal listener. If you want to know more about the Patton family, Stephanie's book is. Lady of the Army, The Life of Mrs. George S. Patton. I will put a link on the website and in the show notes. Please don't forget, if you have enjoyed this episode of the show, why not consider becoming a patron? You can find out more at patreon.com slash www2podcast. For patrons, Patreon will give you a custom RSS feed, which you can put into your podcast software, which you can use to get extra World War II chat and advert-free episodes magically appearing on your device. So that is patreon.com slash www2podcast. Well, that is all from me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88 millimeter gun hit our tongue, blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander in Chief, I have granted a military armistice.